Hi, this is work. Thank you. Um, um, I don't have a singular outcome from this presentation, and I'm open to where this starting point may go after today. Um, as a researcher, writer, and artist interested in the built environment and everything which intersects with it, I'm keen to weave together disparate ideas and elements to create uh, new stories, refresh vantages, and think anew upon what we have experienced and what we have to now to collectively consider going forwards. Um, and I'll rattle forwards and backwards through centuries and ideas, uh, the real and the unreal. I think it's important that the discourse of architecture transcends the silos and closed relationships, but that it widens discussion and relates as widely as possible. Uh, this means intersections with other times, creative disciplines, theories, and geographies. Uh, and this talk will centre on London, or start in London, a place that I know intimately, and which I find can act as a useful frame or starting point to consider wider shared concerns, not least because in 2020, uh, in London and Britain, we face authoritarian and environmental concerns, as many in the world and in the talks tonight also share. Uh, this is Chatsworth House, um, a very quick bit about me to start with. I used to work in conservation architecture on grand historic buildings like this. Monuments which, through the act of restoration and conservation, will stand for generations to come, uh, reminding people of past glories, personal stories, power and pomp. Uh, also places such as this, which was the first experiment in Gothic revival architecture created by the son of the then British Prime Minister, um, a space of personal experiment which adapted an aesthetics of the past into a contemporary uh, setting, uh, funded by inequality and privilege. Both beautiful buildings, but not ones that overtly interest me in their role as monument. Um, I left architecture, and in my writing and visual practice, I still take a strong interest in those central themes of history, place, embedded meaning, and the social connections with and without architecture. Uh, indeed, acting as a critic, writer, and artist, I think there can be more agency sometimes to poke the sector from the outside and to draw connections uh, from what is often a very insular conversation to a wider audience, a lay audience, uh, with often tangential concerns. Uh, from 2015, I was a prominent opponent to this, uh, a proposed bridge some of you might know in central London. Uh, there were many reasons uh, why uh, for opposition, and I was just one of many, many people who were opposing it on grounds of environmental damage, greenwash, questionable procurement, political entitlement, heritage damage, public expense, and lack of evidence transport need. Uh, in 2017, it was cancelled, falling down before it was even started, and it will now exist forever only as this kind of computer-generated image, the kind of image we're all kind of familiar with, Unreal cities in a glowing digital fog, imaginary places populated by ghosts within a sort of phantasmagoric glow. Uh, and what is our neoliberal city of 2020 if it isn't just a heap of broken computer-generated images? Uh, the bridge was intended to be the iconic legacy of Boris Johnson, then Mayor of London and current populist British Prime Minister. Uh, one thing about it which struck me from the beginning was how the designer tried to present it as if the city had always been waiting for it, as if it was a destiny and everything in London's past had been in preparation for this moment of genius. Repeatedly relating it to the nostalgia and mythology of St Paul's Cathedral, uh, he drew from romanticised and often questionable ideas of London's history to present it not only as a critical part of London now, but also of London for thousands of years to come. He said that the bridge will be free for every Londoner to go across for a thousand years, and that it was a project for a thousand years. Uh, this idea of the architectural object as permanent is not new, and the notion of design as monument has forever affected how cities are shaped in both physical and cultural identity, each project trying to become the crowning glory of a place, a career, an ideology, or a period. In this image, which I'm sure many of you, if not all of you know, John Soane's Bank of England is shown as a ruin, as if a future historian has sketched its discovery. Uh, in doing so, it creates the idea that both this building and the cultures, ideology, and empire it represented will, in a thousand years, be looked back upon as glorious moment in civilization's past. And this conflation of the idea of future ruin and ruin lust within it traverses across ideologies and aesthetics. Hitler's architect, Speer, not only had the immediate impactful presence of his designs in mind, but also the idea that in the distant future, they would be looked back on as a keystone of civilization story as much as Athens or Rome. By using special materials, he said, we should be able to build structures which even in a state of decay after thousands of years would more or less resemble Roman models. Another approach of this monumental architecture is to imprint the very language into the landscape. Littoria was a project devised under Mussolini, the creation of a new town constructed on a mosquito-inhabited wasteland outside of Rome. 
It articulated both the aesthetic of the political project, but also of man's control over nature, and it is nearly always men, um, enforcing rationality and structure into swamps that had confounded even the Roman Empire before. Uh, Litoria, now called Latina, was a project that would stand as a monument in perpetuity, with the very initial of Mussolini outlined into the project, forever looking skywards. All these ideas were designed with the idea that they would be seen by the future historian as a glorious and symbolic moment of the ideology or individual of their time. And while are perhaps examples on the more extreme end, I think they speak to an approach to architecture as monument which has to become something of the past. Uh, Paul Noble is a British visual artist who has similarly created a language from architectural form, initially creating this three-dimensional type carved from drawn quarries, uh, folding in ideas of modernist form, new towns and politics to urban growth, sprawl and development. He then uses these letters, these carved letters, um, he then uses these architecture letters to map out an unreal and growing city, Nobson, Newtown. All the areas of the city, seafront, shopping mall, town centre, villas, parks, cemetery, are all drawn in the same orthographic projection, uh, where the eye has the same relationship to every object and with no perspectival distancing. We, the viewer, are both near and far, everywhere and nowhere. It is a place incorporating the myth of the past, the politics of the present, and the imaginary of the future. Uh, for 25 years, Noble has been developing this ever-expanding rural and urban landscape, new series of drawings plugging on to existing parts of Nobs and Newtown. The letters which we saw carved from the quarry deployed across various extensions to the town, used to not only shape the architecture and the imaginary landscapes, but also spelling out fragments of texts and quotes, the city as existential graffiti, where sent sentences become streets. This part of Nobs and Newtown is the central section, and is in a state of disrepair after a nearby monumental shopping centre has been constructed, uh, drawing, sucking up the wealth, leaving the old town centre run down. Like slow sculptures, their forms reveal the true form within the softening of time. Hard to read, the crumbling blocks are both disfigured architecture and language. But there is a quote that one can make out with concentration, a series of lines from T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring. T.S. Eliot's 1922 poem, The Wasteland, meanders around the idea of crumbling nostalgia, mixing with an uncertain future, and the weight of the present, trying to find which cracks are ones from which new life may grow, and which cracks are structural. This is The Wasteland. Perhaps we're in a similar place now, in our heap of broken images. And in The Wasteland, as with Nobson Newtown, we exist in a different version of the present, one which is observed by the past and the future, and which the watching we is uncertain, collective, and separate from the powers which shape the place. The poem, Wasteland, is a series of seemingly disconnected fragments, as if we overhear snatched moments from unknown crowds as they pass through the city. Ghosts haunt, and the city, the financial centre of London, is a key protagonist within the words, a world shadowed by world war and financial collapse. The ruins of the past, recent and distant, litter the wasteland. The philosopher Bertrand Russell had told T.S. Eliot that he imagined, quote, seeing the bridges of London collapse and sink, the whole great city vanishing like a morning mist, its inhabitants seeming like hallucinations. Eliot had also studied Gustave Doré's series of London prints, which are on the right and the previous slide, engravings which excavate the inequality embedded into London's 19th century power and mythology. For a short period, in the early 1800s, when Gustave Doré was working, this character in the corner, called the New Zealander, appeared in popular British writing and drawing. He was an imagined future visitor to London from the next great civilization, looking upon the ruins of, Roman, of, the, of the British Empire and all its architectural and ideological detritus. The New Zealander became a temporary shorthand for the future. And the final image of Gustave Doré's series of, London, of 180 London prints was this one of the New Zealander in the future looking out over the wasteland of London. And so I wonder what a new New Zealander would offer our current thinking on architecture. Perhaps a new New Zealander wouldn't be a single person, but like the narrator in Eliot's Wasteland could be a changeable us, representing all the possible communal futures which we would hope the future to judge us on now. They could be decolonized, feminist, queer, radical, communal, and they would want to look upon our generation's architecture not as icon or romantic ruin, but something they could still use, adapt, build upon, and inhabit in new ways. In all the potential future climates, both political and environmental, they would be relating to what we leave behind in different ways. 
and they may offer a foil for us to be, critique and consider what we build now. So, what I present here is not so much a complete idea, but a starting position, one centering on this idea of the new New Zealander as an imagined future occupant and observer of what we leave behind. With the anniversary of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland in two years' time, and with all the architectural, economic, and social resonances, it would be an interesting landscape to use as a base tapestry. But so would the work of people like Paul Noble and Derek Jarman, Hannah Arendt and James Baldwin, uh, W.G. Sabeld, Walter Benjamin, and Donna Haraway, as we saw, and many, many more, perhaps including ideas from other future architecture platform fellows. And in an age of climate breakdown, narratives which discuss, which discuss an anti-monumental architecture need to pass into popular discourse, where architecture is not a singular monument of, monumental object, but an adaptable mechanism or approach, folding in and around text, as well as a heap of broken images, where the sun beats and the dead trees give no shelter. <laughs>